Let's go ahead and dive into this. Welcome class to Classics 160B1, Meet the Ancients. I, of course, am a professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we get to find out what happens to Julius Caesar. How awesome is that, right? I know you've been waiting for it all course, or maybe you haven't, but either way, that's what we are doing today. Let's go ahead and bring down the projector, turn down the lights, fire this thing up for lecture 12.3, Veni Veni Vici, right? Or Weni Weni Wiki, if you uh, take Latin. So here is the plan for today. We are gonna start um, with a few announcements. We will recap the Gallic Wars, right? Caesar's conquests in Gaul, uh, where we left off last time with him like destroying like a third of the population. That's like black death level kind of destruction there. Really crazy stuff. Um, then we are going to see uh, how he moves out of Gaul throughout the rest of the Roman world, just kicking ass all over the place, and then finally returns home to Rome, where the senators think he gets a little too big for his britches. <laughs> so that, of course, leads to our final topic, the Ides of March. Now, the plan for today uh, is going to be to do that lecture for about the first half of class, all right? So we're gonna try to wrap up the lecture portion around 12.25, 12.30. If you've got any friends who aren't here right now and that usually show up at 12.42 to do the uh, attendance, text them or message them or something and say, get here early today, because that's gonna happen earlier. Um, and uh, then what we're gonna do for the second half is if you're doing the honors project, uh, we're gonna bring out the old um, virtual reality headset. We are gonna meet and engage for that. Um, and we will go from there. So let's go ahead and, oh, one more announcement. You have one more writing assignment left, all right? If you turned in today's thing, you've got one more a week from today, you're just normal weekly writing, and then you're done. You can forget how to write, right? Just like the Greeks in the Dark Ages. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't forget how to write. Part of the whole point of this class is that you learn to, learn to write effectively. But um, yes, you can breathe and relax a little bit and focus on that final project. Okay, so recapping, guys, Julius Caesar, right? Before we even get into Caesar, I want to start way back with the beginning of the Republic, right? So just like get that in your mind. Remember the Republic and Lucius, or uh, yeah, Lucius Junius Brutus and Lucius Tarquinius uh, Colatinus, the two senators who overthrew Tarquin the Proud, the last king of Rome, because he was being a total jerk. And they're like, get on out of here. We're found in a Republic. <laughs> and, uh, and from that day, right, the guiding ideology of the Republic has been no kings in Rome, right? That's the core thing, no kings in Rome. And I just wanted to start with that because that's gonna come a big deal later in today's lecture. Now, when we started with Julius Caesar, we saw that he was related to Gaius Marius, who was one of the populares, right? One of the people who uh, fought on behalf of the regular people who kind of pushed against the traditional like aristocracy of the Roman Senate um, and who relied on means of gathering the support of regular people to make their way in politics. So that's what Caesar's doing. And we see that he worked his way up the traditional cursus honorum, right? In Latin, which means the course of honors or the route of honors. And uh, there's a traditional kind of path that everybody takes if you're getting high into high levels of Roman politics. And it starts with being a quaestor, right? And that is the dude who manages finances, Sounds very boring, incredibly important. And this is where he becomes friends with Marcus Licinius Crassus, right? The richest dude in Rome. Then we see him start to be making these strategic alliances, right? So we see Mar uh, Caesar marry the daughter of Pompey the Great, right? One of the great Roman generals of all time. Caesar marries his daughter in order to build a strong connection with this really popular and really prestigious uh, and really celebrated Roman general. Next up, we see Caesar becoming edile, right? And as edile, what you're responsible for are religious performances and rituals, as well as like games and things like that. Um, and so what he ends up doing is throwing a massive amount of games in Rome, right? So he throws all these gladiatorial contests, he's rebuilding roads, like the things that Roman people want to do every day Caesar is 
like making that happen at a scale that just hadn't been done before. Now, he's going into all sorts of debt in order to do this, right? Borrowing money from Crassus, borrowing money from other aristocrats. And so as Praetor, he's got to actually go out, lead the army in Spain and get some of that money back through conquests. Along the way, he becomes the Pontifex Maximus, right? One of these positions that's held for life. He gets the position by bribing everybody. You can just assume he's always bribing people no matter what. Uh, and he becomes the high priest in Rome for the rest of his life. And again, one of the cool kind of things is that that title of Pontifex Maximus, that's still used today, right? That's one of the titles for the Pope. And then finally, 10 years after he first became quaestor, he reaches the highest level of Roman government, right? And that is becoming the consul in 59 BCE. And they actually call this year the, uh, the consulship of Julius and Caesar, right? So remember the rule with the consul is you always have to have two of them and they're only supposed to rule for one year. Uh, the other guy had such a small impact, was so piddly and couldn't stand up to Caesar uh, that they just kind of called it the year of the consulship of Julius and Caesar, because even though he was one dude, he kind of played both roles. Now, after being consul, right, uh, he ends up going off to Gaul. And he does that with the support of these two other guys, right? This is part of the first triumvirate. Uh, we've got Pompey, the great, the famous general. We've got Crassus, the richest dude in Rome. Funny story about Crassus, he's, he doesn't get a very good reputation. One of the things that he's said to have done uh, is he would go, like Rome in its earliest days didn't have like, they didn't have like a fire brigade, right? You couldn't like, if you had a fire at your house, you couldn't call up like the fire station and ask for them to send the truck. But private people did kind of have these things. And so what he would do is he would have his own like fire brigade and he would go start fires at people's houses. He would like go set their house on fire. And then he would show up after it started burning with his fire brigade to put it out. And what he would tell them is like, I will buy your house right now for 30% of what it's worth. And if you sell it to me, I'll go ahead and put out the fire. And if you don't sell it to me, I'm just going to let it burn down. And so he's kind of a jerk. He's not a very well-respected dude, even though he's very, very rich. Okay, anyway, so this is Caesar's team, the first triumvirate. And uh, Caesar goes about trying to make everybody happy, right? Making senatorial debate public, getting land for Pompey's veterans, getting tax breaks for Crassus, and then heading off to Gaul. And in Gaul, we want to remember that his... Provincia, right? His, the area in which he has power and the right to control the army is just kind of in a very limited region. So this map could be a little bit better here, but it's this region right down, right down here, right? So Gaul on the close side of the Alps, Narbonensis kind of on the French Riviera, Riviera. He's not supposed to be anywhere up here, all right? He's definitely not supposed to be in Britain. But what he's saying is that these tribes up here, they're messing with the tribes that are allied to Rome. And as a result, he's got to go put those tribes in their place in order to protect the allies of Rome. And then he uses that to just go start conquering and murdering everybody. Now, one of the important things here that we want to remember is that when we're looking at Gaul, right, these are kind of all different mini tribes out of the Celtic population, right? Um, so even though they're all Celts, they're actually pretty different, right? They follow different customs. They've got different leaders. They follow, you know, they, they live in different regions. They're not very coordinated when it comes to, uh, to politics or military or culture. And as a result, it's really hard for them to put up a fight against Caesar. Now, once Caesar starts conquering, right, you can kind of see him want to start being the greatest Roman ever, right? Really above and beyond what any general had done before. And so he crosses the Rhine River as the first Roman general ever to, ever to go over into Germany there, right? And the year later, he crosses the English Channel into Britain, the first Roman general ever to go over there. And the second time he does that, it's with such a large force, it is the largest naval landing, like, for 2,000 years until D-Day in World War II. That many ships show up on British shores. And one of the interesting things, one of the reasons we think 
that he's really only kind of interested in being the first to do these things is that he never stays very long. He never like actually goes through with like a full blown conquest in Germany or in Britain. And he doesn't set up any kind of government or anything there. He just gets people to sign a peace treaty, kind of admit that they lost the battle, and he's able to take that back um, to the people in Rome and say, hey, look, I conquered the Britons for the first time ever. All right, now, the Gauls have been getting their butts whooped for a while now, half a decade, and eventually this guy, Vercingetorix, decides that it's about time that they start bringing the tribes together. Right? If they are going to repel the Roman advances, they need to do so as a team. And so he starts to gather his tribes, and they make their stand at the site of Elysia. And we talked about this last time, how what Caesar does is he builds this wall around the hilltop fortress where Vercingetorix uh, and the, uh, the Celts are, are located. Right, And this is kind of an example of what one of these um, encircling uh, camps ends up looking like. Right, Spikes. Uh, this kind of vallum fossa thing where you have to go down into the water and then out of it, just uh, like up the other side, just to get to the wall. Um, but Vercingetorix is able to get the word out, able to request a relief force that comes from the outside. Caesar builds another wall, right? He's built like miles and miles of wall at this point. Uh, and eventually they're able to conquer the Gauls on the inside and then repel the Gauls on the outside. And they take Vercingetorix captive in 52, and they actually put him in prison for like another half decade until Caesar can get back and, and um, go through with his triumphal procession where he leads Vercingetorix out in front, showing the superiority of the Roman people. Okay, so uh, we concluded last time talking about those numbers that over the course of these, you know, almost 10 years, seven or eight years, uh, Caesar ends up probably killing about a sixth of the population of Gaul, about a million people. He ends up enslaving about another million people. We're talking a third of the population has just been completely wrecked by Caesar's conquest, right? And it's kind of important to keep this sort of thing in mind when, um, you know, you think about it. And on the one hand, right, you, you can think about the military success of Caesar and his ability to lead the troops, and it's all very impressive on, on one front. And then on the other front, you think that, like, these are actual, like, real people in Gaul, right? Like, this is like a genocide that Caesar is going through with here. Um, and so it's kind of important to keep perspective looking at it from both sides there. All right, so Caesar has got a problem, all right? His problem is that his, uh, his right to the proconsulship, which allows him to have the army and allows him to be up in Gaul in the first place, is about to run out. And in order to get reelected, he's got to get back to Rome. All right? And in order to get back to Rome, he's got to leave his army in Gaul. And this is a problem because the, the Roman Senate has really turned on Caesar. They see what he's doing and they hear what he's doing and they do not, like, they think this guy is going way overboard. Even his good friend Pompey turns on him. And when Pompey's daughter dies, right, who was the wife of Caesar, that's kind of their last connection that breaks them apart. And Pompey's trying to, br like, bring up legislation against Caesar, making bribing illegal, and then making that law retroactive to apply to him. And then the Senate is saying that there's all sorts of other things that are wrong, too. They're saying that, hey, you weren't even allowed over the Alps into Transalpine Gaul. You weren't even allowed into Germany. You weren't allowed into Britain. All that stuff was illegal. You need to be locked up. And Caesar's got this problem, right? If he goes back to get reelected to the proconsulship, which again would make him immune for another five years until that one would run out, he's got to leave the army behind, right? You can't bring an army into Italy. They kind of made that rule after Marius and Sulla, like started fighting each other with their own Roman armies. They say, no more Roman armies in Italy. We don't need that. But then he thinks if he doesn't have the army, they're going to arrest him and probably kill him. And so in January of 49, he stuck it with his army at the Rubicon River, right? So this is Italy, Rome's down here, uh, and the Rubicon is up in northern Italy. And it's the boundary between, like, Italy proper and then what we call Cisalpine Gaul, Gaul on the Italian side of the Alps, right? 
And what he decides to do in January of 49 is he's like, all right, let's go for it. I don't care what the laws are. I don't care what the rules are. I'm going with my army to Rome to go get reelected. All right. So he illegally brings his army across the Rubicon, as you can see over here. Right. And as he does so, right, the famous saying that Caesar has is alia yacta est, which is Latin for the die is cast, meaning there is no going back at this point. Right. Like, let the chips fall where they may. This is happening. And at this time, Caesar is declared an enemy of the state of Rome. Right. Remember when they did that to Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus earlier on? Now, uh, Caesar is declared an enemy of the, of the state. Now, the Senate has a big problem, right? Remember I said that there weren't armies allowed in Italy. And the Senate, with all the senators and former consuls, they've got former troops all around the empire, right? But they're not in Italy. It's going to take a bunch of time to get them back into Rome, right? So the Senate thought that the people would, like, rise up against Caesar. And they would be like, Oh, like, Caesar, you're a tyrant. We don't want you, right? Get out of here. But the people love Caesar, right? Caesar's going through Italy on his march to Rome, and he's saying, hey, you come over to my side. I'm going to forgive you. Even the senators, if you flip, I'll forgive you. People, here's a bunch of money from my conquest in Gaul. Caesar is making friends everywhere. So the Senate completely underestimated how the people would react to Caesar marching on Rome. They thought they would put up a fight against it. Instead, they joined Caesar's side. They also thought that like people like Pompey would be able to get his army together in time to defend the city. But Pompey's army is like out in Spain somewhere, right? It just can't happen in time. And Caesar is going faster than anybody expected. So what ends up happening uh, within a couple months is Caesar is in the city of Rome. All the senators have to flee, right? All the anti-Caesar senators have to flee. And Caesar takes over, right? He installs his own magistrates in the different offices there. He takes control of the Roman treasury. That's a big one. That's an important one, right? And then he starts heading abroad to take care of the people he feels like turned on him, right? He feels like the Senate turned on him and he's going to go handle his business. But it's not quite clear what he should do first, right? So Rome's in chaos because of all this, right? Uh, his former general in Gaul has, like, flipped sides and is now, like, teaming up with Pompey. Pompey's army, which is a really formidable army, which was very, very strong, it's out in Spain. And then you've got Pompey himself, who's, like, fled east to Macedonia and Greece. And he's got to decide what to do here. And what he ends up doing is he decides, all right, first, let's deal with Rome to whatever extent I can, right? That's installing those magistrates, trying to bring it into order. And then he goes after Pompey himself, all right? And this battle is going to take place at the site of Pharsalus, which is in northern Greece, right? The province of Macedonia. And it's Caesar versus Pompey, right? Once best friends, now they've turned against each other. Now, during the battle, Caesar is pretty well outnumbered, right? So just in terms of the regular number of troops, he's outnumbered two to one. And in terms of cavalry, right, the most effective of the troops, he's outnumbered five to one. But what he ends up doing is he ends up taking his best infantry and pulling them off to the side. And he hides them within the reeds in this kind of marshy area. And when Pompey's cavalry ends up attacking, right, he's able to get behind the cavalry with this infantry group and basically slaughter them. And with the cavalry of Pompey slaughtered, He's then able to rout the rest of the army. Pompey's troops end up fleeing. Pompey himself flees the battle, which is a really, really bad look when you're a renowned Roman general. And he doesn't just flee the battle. He flees the entire area, right? So he gets on a ship and he sails off to Egypt to get out of there. So Caesar has defeated Pompey um, and he is not done yet, right? He hears that Pompey has fled. He hears that he's gone to Egypt um, and Caesar's going to go chase him down there. All right. But before Caesar gets there, Pompey lands and Egypt is in the middle of a big civil war. On the one side, we've got Cleopatra, right? Like V Cleopatra, right? 
who's daughter of one of the Ptolemaic kings. And on the other side, we've got her younger brother, Ptolemy the 13th. And so it's like brother and sister fighting with each other for control of Egypt. Ptolemy the 13th, the younger brother, hears that Pompey has showed up and he asks for his head, right? So he kills Pompey and his goal there is to like try to get Caesar onto his side in this civil war. But when Caesar shows up, like Caesar thinks this is a terrible thing, right? He's like, you've killed my friend. You've killed such a worthy Roman. And he ends up taking Cleopatra's side instead. So now at this point, Pompey's dead. Marcus Licinius Crassus, right, the rich dude, he's dead. He tried to go win military fame out in Parthia and uh, he got slaughtered immediately and they beheaded him and it was, it was bad. He actually lost, this is actually important, during the, the Crassus thing out east, he lost the Roman standard. You know the, the, like, the thing on the pole uh, with the like, kind of SPQR like, flag and then the, the golden eagle up top, right? The thing that you carry out in front of battle. Crassus, it's like the symbol of Roman. Crassus loses it to the Parthians. And that's going to become important later with the successor of Caesar. Anyway, Caesar goes off to Egypt and uh, when in Egypt, he teams up with Cleopatra, right? Um, and they end up defeating Ptolemy the 13th, installing her as the leader of Egypt. And they also have themselves a little love affair here, right? Caesar's only child is the product of this relationship. They call him Caesarion, which very literally translates as little Caesar over here. <laughs> and um, yes, so Caesar has this relationship with Cleopatra. And then he's like, all right, well, can you raise our child for a while? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, can you raise our child for a little while? I've got a lot more murdering to do. And so then he goes up into modern day Turkey. Um, and in modern day Turkey, he ends up fighting Farnakis at the Battle of Zela. That's where he's like, Veni, Vidi, Vici, right? I came, I saw, I conquered. And after that, then he's out to Africa. He feels like the uh, senators are mounting a resistance in Africa, especially Cato the Younger, who every speech would end up bringing down Caesar at the end. And Caesar dominates in Africa as well. So now he's killed Pompey, right? Pompey's out of there. He's won in Egypt. He's won in uh, modern day Turkey and Pontus. He's won in Africa. And finally, he ends up going back to Rome. All right? Now in Rome, Caesar ends up uh, doing a few things that like are a little bit out of the ordinary, right? So he starts changing around month names. He's like, no longer shall we have Quintilius, the fifth month. Now we have the month of Julius, right? Named after his family. And uh, which of course is our month, July, right? He makes himself dictator for 10 years, right? Now the sole ruler, that's what the dictator was. Um, he becomes the prefect of morals. Um, and has the power of a censor, the guy who like takes the census everywhere. Um, he makes it a law that he's always the first to speak of in the Senate. And then he sets up a statue of himself. This is kind of an interesting one, right across from the statue of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill, right? The same size and everything. Kind of making it a statue saying that he's equal to the gods. But he's not done yet. There's still some senators wandering around, right? And in particular, it's the sons of Pompey. They've gone out and fled to Spain. He's like, can't be having that. Goes out to Spain, incredibly bloody battle. Uh, ends up taking care of business there. And then finally goes back to Rome for good. Now he does some weird things there too. He throws a triumph for himself, for the victory over the senators, which everybody's like, um, it's a little weird because you're supposed to throw triumphs when you conquer foreign foes, not when you kill other Romans. He's like, whatever, I do what I want. Uh, he starts reforming the whole city of Rome. He builds himself a forum. He calls it the Forum of Julius Caesar. And he builds a temple to Venus Genetrix, or Venus the Mother, in, uh, in that forum. And again, remember, that's the link back to uh, Aeneas and Anchises and Aphrodite and Venus. So a kind of link to show his divine lineage. He starts building colonies in different places and extending citizenship within Rome. He's the first person to ever put a living person's face on a coin, right? So this is kind of weird, right? Before it was deceased people who you'd commemorate with coinage. 
Now Caesar's alive and putting his own face on coins. Uh, we talked about um, the new calendar, right, with the month of July and a reorganization around the solar year instead of the lunar year. And in many ways, he starts acting like a king, right? He's no longer standing when the Senate speaks. He has the statue of himself across from Jupiter. He has that crowned with the crown of a king. He's wearing purple robes, the color of the kingship. And he actually attempts to get crowned in the Roman Forum. So this happens twice. So he has his general, Mark Antony, try to crown him in the Roman Forum. And each time this happens, he denies the crown, right? He's like, no, 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 I don't want it. And then Mark Antony waits a little bit and he tries to crown him again. And Caesar's like, no, no, I don't want it. And people have argued, what's the purpose behind this, right? Some argue that he wanted to show the people that he really didn't want to be king, right? And this was a way to do that. Others argue that he was kind of waiting to see what the people would say, right? That it's kind of a thing that after the first one, maybe the people would cheer this crowning, right? And they would want a new king in Rome, and then he would accept the crown. But that cheering never happens, and he denies the crown both times. But the Senate at this point has had enough, right? They are like, I don't care whether you actually got crowned or not, you are acting like a king. And they've got to act quickly. He's supposed to leave for Parthia in three days, and so they've got to act really, really quickly to get together a plan. And that plan is going to be executed on the Ides of March, March 15th in 44 BCE. Now, there's all sorts of stories of omens and Caesar getting kind of bad omens not to go to a particular place at a particular time. And his general, Mark Antony, is trying to warn him. But Caesar's feeling invincible or he knows what's coming and he doesn't care. Um, and he makes his way into the Senate. Um, within the complex of the theater of Pompey. So this is Rome, right? Uh, this is the Campus Martius over here. And the theater of Pompey is where this little red star is. And we can see on the recreation of Rome, this is the theater of Pompey here. And then there's this complex on the front and a series of buildings uh, at the front here. And one of these buildings is an alternate Senate house. And that's where that meeting was gonna take place. Now, one of the really cool things is that this place has been excavated in Rome. Like when you go to Rome, you can go around and see the place where Caesar was executed. This is known as Largo Argentina, and it's a series of four different Republican era temples out in front. And then this, these are the foundations of that Senate house right behind it. And so it's somewhere right around there where Caesar would have been assassinated. One of the very cool things is that the, assassinate, like the area of the assassination now has become a cat sanctuary. And so people like leave their cats there and you can go there and their cats climbing around on all sorts of different things. But the, uh, the, the assassination itself was very important and symbolic, right? And if you've heard that phrase, a tu brute, right? Even you, Brutus, that gets back to one of the senators involved in the assassination. And that, remember, was the great, 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 great grandson of Lucius Junius Brutus. It's Marcus Junius Brutus, the great, 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 great grandson. Um, and uh, he had to be involved in that assassination because it was so symbolic of what his great, great, great grandfather did, throwing out the last king of Rome with Tarquin the Proud 500 years earlier. So Caesar is assassinated by 23 of the senators. Rome is left in complete chaos at this time. You can still go visit the site of the assassination itself, now a cat sanctuary. Uh, and that is the end of uh, Caesar's life, but not the end of craziness in the Roman Republic. So let's go ahead and do uh, attendance for today. The answer is red. So go ahead and put in red, the color of Caesar's blood for today's attendance. Once you do that, um, if you're not doing the honors project, feel free to get out of here and get an early lunch. Um, and yeah, get an early lunch and I will see you guys on Monday.